veterans and others who have had to deal with classified intelligence are all asking, how can an enlisted National Guardsman have had such access to top secrets? Joining me now is Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, a former Navy intelligence officer, also, of course, a former mayor and presidential candidate. Mr. Secretary, welcome. And I, of course, I'm going to ask you in a moment about the, the nation's critical infrastructure. But first, as a former intelligence officer, how does this happen? Well, uh, obviously, I can't speak much to the uh, documents or, or the law enforcement process that's underway, but uh, uh, there are so many people, uh, certainly uh, people like me who have served in the military, had to deal with these kinds of documents, uh, who are remembering just how very, very seriously uh, they were taken, just as they are now in, in, in the work that, uh, that we do in the department. And uh, I know that uh, this is being treated with the appropriate seriousness, because it's, uh, it's not a small thing, you know, from day one. Uh, when you're in the military or any position where you're entrusted with these kinds of documents, uh, it is made very clear to you how important it is to handle them responsibly and uh, uh, obviously uh, a lot of questions being asked right now. Yeah, and, and as someone in charge of transportation writ large and infrastructure, you deal with classified documents as well as a cabinet secretary. So let's turn to keeping our infrastructure safe. It's on the voters' minds as 2024 is approaching. We're talking about $300 million to repair and replace more than a dozen bridges. You and the vice president were touting projects just this week. Is the work you're doing resonating with the American people? Is it breaking through all of the other, you know, focus on um, the former president we won't name right now and all the legal problems, all the controversies? I think so. There's a lot of excitement as we've been traveling, as you noted, the vice president uh, and uh, uh, several other uh, members of the administration have been fanning out. This is week three of our Invest in America tour, uh, delivering more good news and just the look in the eyes of uh, community leaders when, when uh, we're able to arrive and say, yes, this bridge that you've known about for, for years is going to be fixed. Uh, th this road you've been trying to get adjusted for a long time, this airport that's needed to be uh, dealt with, we're getting the funding to do that. Uh, it, that uh, it's a huge deal. Now, admittedly, uh, you know, when we have good news, uh, often good news that people from either side of the aisle could agree is a good thing, uh, it doesn't always get the same attention as, as uh, the hot controversy or the, uh, the, the, the bad news of the day. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why we're making sure that Americans uh, are seeing the impact of what we've done, our travel. I mean, this latest round of announcements, uh, and, and this is just the freshest out of the president's uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, this is about $295 million going to improve bridges in nine different areas of across the country. And this is going to make a real difference in everyday life, especially if you live near one of these bridges that has had to be closed or had a, a limit put on the load that can go over it, which can affect everything from school buses to ambulances. Uh, you know, yesterday as we uh, made the announcement that the bridge I was at in Castleton, which is a rural area in upstate New York, we heard from a, a, a business owner who has a bottling operation that the bridge was in such rough shape that often it would be closed for repair. They would have to completely uh, uh, change the way that their trucks moved. That cost uh, money and time and, uh, for that matter, meant more uh, uh, idling, more emissions going into the air. So it really is a win-win-win when we're able to make these improvements. It's exactly why we pushed so hard to get this bipartisan infrastructure law passed in the first place. I want to ask you about rail derailments because the Washington Post reports that the FAA referred 250, um, well, this is first the airports, unruly passenger cases to the FBI during the pandemic, and we've seen more incidents recently. So let's talk first about uh, the flights. What are the chances of a national no fly list for these unruly passengers? Well, the, the, the latest news is uh, over a dozen new referrals, as, in, as, you, as you mentioned, this is part of uh, uh, about 250 since uh, two years ago when we uh, announced a closer partnership with the Department of Justice, with the FBI, to hold people accountable. I think that's a big part of the reason why we have seen an 80 percent drop in the rate of these kinds of uh, unruly passenger incidents since they peaked. Uh, but even one of these incidents is too many. And the message is loud and clear uh, to uh, treat flight crews and your fellow uh, passengers with respect and that there will be uh, serious legal consequences, sometimes including prosecution, if you don't do that. There are other measures that continue to be talked about. Many airlines have built a kind of a no-fly list when they have somebody who has behaved in this way who they don't want flying on their airline. Uh, more work to and be done, I think, in terms of coordinating that across different airlines, and that's an active discussion right now. And briefly, let me ask you about the rail derailments. You're going to be testifying about that next week. Yeah, so this uh, continues to be uh, an extremely important issue. It's one of the reasons 
why we are pushing so hard uh, for the bipartisan Railway Safety Act that is uh, moving along in the Senate. Uh, I, I've seen uh, a lot of attention, rightly so, on the issue of rail accidents and derailments. What happened to the people of East Palestine, Ohio, who had their lives upended, really uh, helped open Americans' eyes to the fact that I don't think most Americans realized just how often this uh, has happened over the years and over the decades. Uh, there is some kind of derailment literally every Every day, and we don't view that as acceptable. It's time to get tougher on these railroad companies. We did that from day one in this administration, uh, stepping up safety audits that had been slowed down under the last administration, moving forward on rules like requiring that there be at least two people. This sounds like the most basic common sense thing, uh, but we've had to push uh, hard to make sure that we can get toward a, a, a rule that, that says you have to have at least two people on a train that could be sometimes two, three, or more miles long. And and this legislation advancing in the Senate could make a real difference. Now, we have heard from some Senate Republicans saying, not so fast. We shouldn't be so hard on these railroad companies. We shouldn't leap to conclusions. But I can tell you right now, there are steps that we know would make a difference, from tougher accountability, stronger fines, to more requirements about notifying communities when emergency materials are headed through their jurisdictions. That's reflected in the bill. These are the, some of the exact things that uh, I was calling for earlier this year, and really think that there needs to be continued uh, effort and continue pressure to get this done, because otherwise you'll see what we've seen far too many times in the past, which is the uh, freight rail industry uh, corporations lobby successfully stalling or watering down these provisions. And the result is it makes it that much harder to prevent these kinds of accidents and derailments in the future. Well, I want to thank you very much and just say we saw the pictures of you and your family, the cute twins and your husband Chaston at the Easter Egg Roll, and it's just so wonderful to see your happy family. and the other side of Pete Buttigieg. So. Thanks. It was a really great day. Fun for the kids and fun for all of us. You lifted our day. Thank you. And Chastin.